It's the day before England start their World T20 campaign. Tomorrow at the wonderful Optus Stadium here in Perth, they will take on Afghanistan. Owen Morgan knows all about what it's like on the eve of a World Cup, as you would imagine. What's it like? Come on, put us in that dress and what are the players feeling? Yeah, here it's so exciting. Uh, all the prep, all your work over the course of a year since the previous World Cup in the UAE. The, the, a lot of the drive behind the work that you've put in, a lot of determination. Uh, Joss Butler and Matthew Moth, the work that they put in would have been built on you know, the, the lack of success of being knocked out of the semi-final in the previous World Cup. But th the anticipation is like nothing else. I mean, in life, there's probably nothing worse than a missed opportunity. And this certainly being on the eve of the biggest tournament that you play in is just you know, the, the anticipation. You know, will you come out on top? Personal performances, the unity within the team, the question marks around everything that you just want to get going so the guys hopefully will sleep well tonight and wake up tomorrow and, and ju just look forward to the toss and, and, and then know what you're doing and, and crack on from there. Can you get overexcited? Do you need to just try and just take a breath? It's another game of cricket. I know it's a World Cup. Is that one of the challenges that they face at the start of a campaign? Yeah, I, th I think it is. And certainly going in with as strong a squad as, as England have at the moment. You'll have different personalities within that change room. The likes of Mark Wood will be very excited, <laughs> spending a huge amount of energy at training today. And, and, and he'll be conscious of not trying to overdo things, particularly when it's a long tournament and you know how things might pan out and you know, England need him to, to be fit for the majority of the tournament. Then you'll have other very experienced campaigners like Ben Stokes and mm. Joss Butler that will be mm. as relaxed as they ever have been going into t tomorrow. So it's a fine balance and ultimately you want to get through today's training session and, and hopefully have everybody available for tomorrow. Where would you say England are at right now? Because last summer it was a challenge and the results didn't quite go Joss and Matthew Mott's way. There was always going to be that period of transition. Did you expect that and do you think that transition now has been made? Yeah, I do think the transition has been made. And I think in, in, in any period of change, there is always a, a, a certain level of uncertainty, regardless of the team that you are or the person coming in in, in, in the leadership roles. And, and considering there's a significant change with a, a new captain and a new coach, they did struggle to start with. And I think that was probably the most difficult and the, and the biggest learning for, for both Matthew Mott and, and Joss Butler. But they've come out the other side of that. Mm. I think going into the tournament, they've actually transitioned things unbelievably well. The trip to Pakistan, the level of success, the leadership that Mo and Ali has shown. I, th I think it has really galvanised England as a team. And they've turned up to Australia, I think, the most informed team in the tournament. So hats off to them. I think the transition period is now over and they can focus on trying to bring some silverware home. One unfortunate bump in the road has been the injury to Rhys Topley. On a personal level, that's so disappointing for him with all of the back problems he's had. How can that adversely, or can it adversely, affect the way that the campaign starts? Is it a distraction? I, th I think it can potentially be, and, and how it's managed within the setup. Uh, completely can determine the outcome. I mean, Reese is a fantastic guy, not even the, the stuff that he produces on the field, and, and even more recently, the levels of fitness that he showed to constantly produce really strong performances within the side. He, he would have potentially been a starter in the tournament mm. as well. And how Joss and, and, and Matthew Mott manage that through the tournament, I think, is important, um, regardless of how they start and the team that they select. They have to continuously reiterate that that is the best team for that particular game and they get the full backing of the change room because the last thing you want is people sitting around thinking, oh, we still miss Reese after game two or game three into the tournament. Right. Um, we were in a similar situation this time last year when we lost Tymo Mills later on in the tournament, a guy that has mm. fitness issues as well, very similarly to, to Reese Topley. But again, get, getting through that and, and making sure there are players within the squad that can fill that gap. We didn't think we'd be talking about weather and bad weather because we're in Australia, of course. But they've had some sort of weather phenomenon. And in the eastern states, it has been hosing down and Melbourne's pretty much underwater. That could have significant impact on the tournament as a whole. If we get like washouts, which India, Pakistan could be washed out on Sunday, that makes the qualification very, very tricky. Yeah, it, it does. And sort of giving it some sort of context, it actually 
it emphasizes even more so when you do get the opportunity to play a full mm. game that you capitalize on winning. So it makes tomorrow's game against Afghanistan that much more valuable in getting points in the bag before you move east to the other cities. We've got Melbourne next, then Sydney and Brisbane. So if games are affected, you want to go there with comfort of having won games. So when you talk about big games and, and big swings and possibly the other group in the India-Pakistan game, I actually think certain things surrounding it might suit certain teams. If you look at India, for instance, where they struggled last year, was actually getting some initiative into their batting, bringing some positivity, being the players that they are comfortable to be outside World Cups to a World Cup. I mean, the biggest advantage that people have outside of India is actually that India only get to pick 11 players. But because coming with that is a huge amount of pressure mm. and value within that playing 11 that you have to produce in order to be selected, otherwise you'll be punted out. I know things have changed recently with Rohit Sharma and Raul Dravid trying to increase the level of aggression within the side. But if they play in a handful of shortened games to start with, I think that can give them the level of impetus that they need. So they get direction straight away in the tournament, as opposed to the game completely being wiped out uh, as a whole. Um, but it, it certainly creates issues, the, the, the level of... Um, disappointing rain around. <laughs> Certainly didn't expect it down here. As you touched on India, I just want to ask you about that, because NASA's point with India is their fantastic, well, the wealth of talent they have and the backup they have because of IPL, etc., is enormous. They do it very consistently in bilateral cricket, but their biggest challenge, he feels, is to do it consistently in World Cups. Do you agree with him? I totally agree. I do. Playing against India um, for a long time, particularly in World Cups, when England have been strong and, and you know contenders for things. When you play against India, there's a certain element of control that they bring, particularly with their batting. So they'll guarantee you a certain amount of runs and they'll rely heavily on being aggressive at the end. And if you can control that period of the game, which in my opinion can be the biggest period of the game playing against India, you're a half a chance of winning. And for a side like England or Australia when they play against them, sides like England and Australia have numerous resources, great attitudes that can win a game in any moment of the 20 overs. India, I think, sometimes restrict themselves in how they play and, and, and the method they use unless they're chasing. When they're setting, they, I think they find it comfortable and easy because they are heavily big run scorers within that top four. But it, it certainly is a challenge that they will, they will face. Let's touch on England's batting. Powerful stroke makers throughout. In that series against Australia, we saw them being flexible. Da David Milan came down from three, ended up coming in about seven or whatever. Do you think that's the right way to go? Do you think that's the way they will go? And is that quite a challenge for a batter to know? You know, you talk about role definition. I'm coming in at this point, I'm coming in at that point. That flexibility, can it cause confusion? I, I don't think it can. I think once it's communicated well from the captain and coach as to the role that they might see. And your role within a T20 game, particularly as a middle order batter, isn't always completely defined and there isn't always that amount of clarity you'd rather break it down into segments of the game so actually bringing game awareness to the role that you are trying to fulfill for the team right. not just for yourself and i think that the method that they employed against australia i think is the right one because they're taking the the, the they're actually being really selfless mm. in the way that they're approaching. You know, David Milan is, is one of the best players in the world. I think if England are going to win this tournament, he is going to have, a, have to have a fantastic tournament. And I think he's, he's, he's capable of doing that. But the instance that, that, that you're talking about, where he dropped down to number six or seven, I thought was the, the right call. You're into the back end of the 20 mm. overs, a very significant part of that. And you have the likes of Livingston, Ali, Curran, Wokes, that can come in and capitalise more so than David at that moment in time. Um, and I think it sends a great message to the rest of the changing room, regardless of your ability and, and, and your previous success. It's about winning here and now. And it's so important to recognise that pre-tournament as opposed to going into the tournament and then changing everything just because it's a World Cup. So I think there's been, it's been pre-planned and, and, and well executed so far. We mentioned the injury to Reese Topley. Of course, there was the injury to Johnny Bairstow, which meant a recall for Alex Hales. How much of a challenge do you think that was to reintegrate Alex into the side? Yeah, here, by the sounds of it, it, it hasn't been a big challenge whatsoever. I think over the years where Alex has missed out, England have never been in this position where they've actually been short of top-order players. We've always had 
an abundance of players. So you've never been talking about bringing somebody in and selecting them in your first 11. It's always been, right, well, who's the spare batter or who's the second spare batter or the third spare batter and who's the most un unlucky guy mm. who scored a load of runs in, in the 100 or the T20 blast? Who's missing out? So Alex has come in. He's got runs to start with. He looks comfortable. Um, his partnership with Joss Butler at the top is really important because you've you got to remember you only have 120 balls to make a big impact in the game. England back to number 10. You've had Il Rashid coming in at possibly 10 or 11. Mm. And you have to capitalise on that batting lineup because you're not going to win the tournament by playing safe cricket and being three wickets down or four wickets down in an innings. You have to be positive. So it's important for Joss and Alex to get that relationship right, as David has done for a long period of time. David has you know, notoriously come in three or four years ago as a slow starter, but he's completely flipped that on its head in his last two years. He's now unbelievably aggressive, counter acts some of the best bowler bowlers in the opposition, regardless of a, a name or, or how accomplished player they are. So getting that balance throughout the whole of the, the 20 overs is going to be an important factor for England. Talking about balance, how would you balance the side? Yeah, I think it's England's biggest problem yeah. at the moment. <laughs> yeah. They've gone from a side probably six months ago, four months ago, uh, where they were struggling to put their best 11 on the park because they just didn't know it. Mm. I think now we're in a position where Joss is sitting down with the coach and going, well, we have absolute role clarity in every position. We have each position covered twice, but the issue is who, who do we select? We, we have so many players in really good form, mm. and I think it's incredibly difficult. I think the two guys that help that selection are guys like Ben Stokes, Moen Ali, Liam Livingston. Sam? Sam Curran. Mm. I mean, you've got Chris Wokes as well that are mm. genuine all-rounders that you can bat at six or seven and still have a strong team out. I think the, the biggest thing they need to work out is what is their best top six. Right. I think you, you go your best, your strongest batters, your most effective guys against that opposition on that given day, and you back them. You don't just give them one game, you give them the whole tournament. With the bowling, I was at training yesterday, and all of the seamers, so Wokes, Sam Curran, Wood, they were working very closely with David Saker on hitting the hole, hitting the Yorkers. Death bowling, how important? Extremely important. I think every team this evening, whatever, a week ago before the tournament started, will go in thinking, geez, we, we don't have a, an out-and-out out death bowler. And probably the best death bowler in the world, or the two best death bowlers in the world, are not here. Jofra Archer and Jasper Boomerah, mm. they're not here. And, and both teams are hurting because of it. Um, I think England are probably more accomplished than most teams in the tournament. When you look at the group, group that they're in, probably Australia, again, they have question marks over their death bowling as well. It's such an important part of the game, where if you go into that last five four overs of the, the, the game with two in batters, there's very little you can do to stop players. I think the emergence of Sam Curran, yep. both in Pakistan and in Australia in the three games that they played, has been a huge bonus for Joss Butler because he now has a guy that, that has a great attitude towards the end of the game. He's a guy that can compartmentalise a previous delivery and then draw a line under it and, and, and go again and execute it but also probably getting on the plane to Pakistan, they, they wouldn't have relied a lot on Sam Curran towards the end, but now I think he might be a banker. They start against Afghanistan. It's not a start against India or a start against Australia, one of the form horses and the favourites. Nonetheless, it's not an easy start, is it? No, it's not. Not at all. Certainly having, I think, my record as captain against the Netherlands or even playing against the Netherlands, I don't think we've ever beaten them <laughs> <laughs> in a World Cup. Which, you know, you go in laughing about it, but actually, Afghanistan are a really good side. And they pose a different question as to most, you know, lower ranked teams. They have high quality spin. They have good seam attack. The, probably the only question mark is, is around their batting and posting mm. a score at, at various stages. But in, the focus for England tomorrow has to be about going out and regardless of uh, about who they're playing, it has to be, be putting your best foot forward and presenting yourself, starting the tournament really, really well. Because if England do that, they'll blow Afghanistan away. If they give them a sniff, it could be a very niggly game. OK, final one. How will Josh Butler be thinking this evening? How will he sleep? But how did you sleep the eve of the, you know, the day before your first game as captain in a World Cup? Yeah, I've, 
I tended to either try and get to bed early or knacker myself so I was absolutely cooked the night before. I actually remember before the 2019 World Cup, the first game was at the Oval against South Africa and I was in a room next to Jofra Archer and jo Jofra stays up all night playing computer games. <laughs> so at about 3 a.m. I can hear this, no man, no man. So he must have been shot by somebody in the warfare game. So I'd slept well up until that but didn't get any sleep. Um, after that. But I think Joss will sleep well tonight. I go into the tournament as one of the favourites. He's in fantastic form himself. He's a very experienced player and captain, and he, he, he's already said he's unbelievably proud of what he's achieved so far. And on the eve of the World Cup, he's, he'll be very excited. So England start tomorrow against Afghanistan, just over the Swan River of that magnificent new stadium. Can't wait to get going.